Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am DM Bloodworth and as you can see by the graphics, uh, today's video is going to be a continuation of my AD&D 2nd Edition series of videos, but today's video is the first of the Character Class Handbooks. So I'm going to be running through these in alphabetical order. And so the first one up is the Barbarian's Handbook. I am doing a preview of this, so I will go over basically the table of contents and a, and a couple key areas of it. But uh, if you wish for me to really focus in on any of the um, uh, any of the elements of this particular book or any of the future uh, complete handbooks uh, for the character classes. Um, Based on your your comments and your requests and uh, and your uh, interest and engagement in each of these books, that will generate the um, you know the necessity for me to dig even deeper in to any one of those particular books. So the best way for you to get me to focus on something is to first let me know. Uh, can you please really look into this a little bit deeper? And uh, of course, you know, subscribe and like and, and comment and do all of those things. Uh, and certainly watch the videos because if the, if the video really does pick up a lot of interest, a lot of engagement, then I will certainly know. Uh, let me take a, a closer look at this. So um, without further ado, let's start flipping through. Now I do have the physical copy here. Um, and, and let me know if you prefer that I do it right from here and going through the book itself and just reading along or if you'd rather me go to the flip throughs which you know are are not as personal let's say and it's not as uh, dynamic I mean I could do it either way um, first of all this is written by Rick Swan I uh, thought I would mention that because as I've said previously, the thing with these splat books for AD&D 2nd Edition was that uh, almost all of them so far have been written by a different primary author. And, and so that's uh, uh, both interesting and, um, you know, as far as, well, you get to see a lot of different, uh, different approaches to writing these books. Um, and that could be a positive or it could potentially be a negative too because uh, as I've seen with some of the, uh, the complete guides of the uh, various racial uh, books that there were, the, um, you kind of lose some continuity as well. Um, so there's, there's probably both pluses and minuses to, uh, to both approaches. So in the meantime, I will, um, I'll start taking a look through here and um, like all the others, I mean, you have some really incredible art. I use this for the thumbnail, although I, I wish I had one as, uh, as clear as this. It kind of got stretched out. But this is the first of the books that I noticed for the color illustrations. We have Clyde Caldwell, Jeff Easley, and Larry Elmore along with Keith Parkinson. I mean, so you have the big four of the TSR era artists, uh, especially the color artists and, and, and Keith Parkinson both for, for interior, uh, you know, color illustrations and black and whites. I mean, you have all four of them right here in this book. So, um, you know, so that truly is a, a great collection of color artists. Um, and then we have the, uh, once again, a Rick Swan is the design. Uh, editing was done by uh, Alan Barney and Roger Moore. So, um, you know, a, a, another Roger Moore being another luminary of, uh, of old school TSR as well. So we have uh, the Barbarian Fighter requirements. I'm going to switch uh, views so I can go over it uh, this way with you. Um, I, I think you'll, you'll have a better time with it this way. All right. So, um, you know, whoa, I jumped all the way to the back. I clicked the wrong number, uh, button. So here we have the complete Barbarian's Handbook. 
And you start with uh, character creation. You have the barbarian fighter, the requirements, the level advancement, the movement, the armor and weapons and physical abilities. You have the shaman, which is the requirements, uh, um, movement, level advancement, armor spells, uh, armor weapons, spells, physical abilities, turning on dead, um, homeland terrain, choosing a homeland terrain and homeland terrain advantages, uh, which applies to both the barbarian fighter and the shaman. Uh, so that's, uh, that is pretty interesting. Um, let's see what else we have. We have the characteristics. So you're going to go with the special characteristics, alignment, magic, talismans, money, language, strongholds, followers, reactions, and penalties, uh, physical abilities, uh, barbarian kits, so a fighter's kit, and you have the various kits, whether it be a, uh, a brush runner, a brute, a forest lord, an islander, a plains rider, a ravager, a wizard slayer. Um, so as you're starting to see here, they're not encompassing barbarian as being a character class and nothing more. They're, they're really taking a look at the barbarian as being um, a societal kind of uh, nomenclature to it. And, and so you have the barbarian fighter and the shaman and their various territories. And then barbarian kits, you have the fighter's kits. And then all of the various versions of that, you have the clerical kits and all the various versions of that. Um, so it's not just a character class like we had seen in um, Unearthed Arcana for AD&D First Edition. Uh, now, there have been various barbarian tribes described in, um, in the world of Greyhawk and, and that setting piece uh, and, and that was the more um, cultural and societal kind of uh, descriptions of them. So here you're kind of bringing them both together in one, you know, in one uh, book. And, and so that I really do like about this. Um, we get into barbarian culture and then role playing. So demographics, barbarians in the out, uh, out world. Uh, common traits, barbarian personality, and experience. Um, here we go into the various tables, uh, clerical tables and everything. Now, I personally would would rather have seen instead of instead of clerics so much, I would have rather had seen um, either druidic magic, attached to barbarian society and culture and uh or runic uh you know rune lore or um certainly like environmental kind or spiritual magic you know so uh you know your four elements or your you know um you know light and and darkness you know kind of um you know, positive and negative energy kind of stuff going on more so than, um, more so than having like clerical abilities assigned to, you know, here they have energies from ancestral spirits and unique pantheon of deities like a druid from nature itself. But, you know, I, I think that Having it attached to deities is is not what I would usually consider to be shamanistic, ma you know, magic. But I, I haven't fully dug into this and correct me if I'm, you know, off base here. Um, but yeah, I will take a look at some of their spells just to see, um, just to see how they change. So uh, shamans have, have access to a limited number of spheres. If a DM allows a shaman to worship a specific mythos, additional sphere limitations may apply. A natural day, a, a nature deity 
for instance, may allow major access only to animal and plant spheres. Uh, some deities uh, may allow spells normally denied to shamans. A fire deity may give major access to sun and elemental spheres, but deny across the um, access to charm and necromantic uh, spheres. All right, so maybe maybe they do actually have more of a uh, elemental sphere uh, connection than I was uh, automatically assuming. So choosing home terrain, um, it's weird they put the, they put the turning, so choosing home terrain, but then they jump right to turning undead, which kind of seems to be in the wrong spot. Um, home terrain advantages, you have survival, you have hiding, you have surprise, you have tracking, and you have animal lore. All right, um, that's pretty interesting. And here's their various home terrains. You have Arctic desert, cold forest, temperate forest, hills, jungle, mountain, plain, swamp, unusual, such as subterranean or aquatic, and then GM's choice. All right, that's interesting. Alignment. Most barbarian societies share the same basic concepts of good and evil. Good actions tend to minimize hostility and promote the welfare of the group, uh, defending the weak, telling the truth, and caring for the sick are universal expressions of goodness. Evil actions tend to promote hostility and benefit the individual at the expense of the group, acts of intentional cowardice, unjustified murder, and wanton destruction are universally expressions of evil. Uh, so you have your lawful good, you have your neutral, uh, lawful neutral, lawful evil, neutral good, true neutral, neutral evil, uh, chaotic good, chaotic neutral, uh, and chaotic evil. So I tend to go chaotic neutral, so let's see. This barbarian resists the constraints of any group indeed for new uh, few groups would want as a member undependable, acting seemingly at random. His erratic behavior is devoid of logic or pattern. You see, this is such a, a strange um, a strange way of depicting chaotic neutral because one of the one of the, the most well-known chaotic neutral barbarians is obviously Conan the Barbarian, and yet uh, this is making chaos sound like it's a, a just like a total, you know, um, unhinged, unreliable, crazy person, which Conan the Sumerian was not. Uh, and so it's, um, it's kind of strange. Uh, they take a really negative view on chaotic neutral here than um, that I've probably seen anywhere else. I mean, this is a pretty extreme view of it. Um, magic divides, uh, so I'm looking at magic now. Barbarian divides magic into two categories. The first, homeland magic, includes spells common to their native territory. I really like that aspect of it. Um... And then the next is uh, the next is going to be more mystical, right? The second category, out, outworld magic, compares the spells and all magical items used everywhere else in the world. All right, so you know, possibly not. I would I would limit barbarians, uh, you know, and, and their shamans and everything to just their homeland uh, magic. Uh, I wouldn't allow them to learn outworld magic because that would um, that would kind of break from the just the concept that maybe I have of them being so so clannish and so territorial and um, and and looking really just to focus on uh, their own 
uh, group culture that to adopt another's magic would be, uh, you know, really quite bizarre, uh, in my opinion. So, um, so yeah, I would, I would do that limitation. Uh, they should shun outside magic, uh, you know, to be honest, uh, in my opinion. Magic items, I am, you know, uh, if they're going to allow barbarians to use magic items, uh, barbarians use only magical items derived from natural materials such as wood, stone, and animal products, or I guess not metal, which metal is a, ma you know, uh, so I guess they can't use um, magic weapons or the effects of low-level clerical spells, sphere, spheres available to the barbarian or relate to the barbarian's homeland in some way. All right. Um, like I can understand like talismans and totems and, and that kind of things, possibly runes, but not, um, you know, not like, like staves and wands and, and that kind of thing, even though staves and wands are made, you know, most likely from wood, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't go that route with it. Let's see, potions, because they can be blended from herbs and minerals and other materials found in remote environments, potions are among the most common magical items used by barbarians. I would rather call them salves or um, concoctions rather than potions having like a magical um, connotation to them. Scrolls, manuals and tombs, because barbarians can't read all magic items, um, they affect depend on the comprehension written words are forbidden. All right, jewelry, barbarians shun rings, necklaces, amulets, and other magical jewelry, uh, primarily made of metal. A particular price may be used if it is made of natural material, all right, um, a piece may be used if it's made of natural material. Gems, magical gems are generally acceptable. Rods, staves, and wands are generally acceptable if made from wood, ivory, or bone. Um, I don't know, I, 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 I lean against that. Most barbarians only use magical clothing that resembles garments they normally wear. Uh, weapons and armor. Barbarians generally avoid magical weapons and armor made of metal. Even magical weapons made a, made of natural materials, such as a wooden club plus one or a dagger plus two constructed from a bone, are highly suspect. All right, so they are, they are sticking to uh, basically the first edition, um, you know, rulings of they really can't use them. Barbarians tend to have the you know at certain levels they start hitting monsters only hit by uh, magical weapons a as a natural uh, form of their um, you know of their character class uh, leveling uh, same thing with monks as well with their unarmed combat so uh, I would expect to see that continuing here uh, unwanted items they leave it alone they give it away they get rid of it incentive both the DM and the players should keep in mind that barbarians' aversion to outworld magic is not a rigid requirement, but a general tendency to encourage good role playing. Consider accepting some of or all of the following rules. Uh, they can ex uh, gain no experience for acquiring and using those magic items. Uh, yeah, so there's there's a number of ways that you can uh, tweak it uh, to. Um, either incentivize or decent, you know, de-incentivize their use. Talismans. And it goes through a whole section here. Like I said, I'm not going to go, uh, I'm not going to go real deep dive into all of this. Um, oh, I like this. They have some hand, uh, hand symbols here. So language. Uh, they have, yeah, because they don't have a written language. So, um, so there are some unique languages, uh, options for them, such as hand singles and, and things. So that's pretty cool. So 
so we'll keep on flipping through. Yeah, some really interesting art. And we're in a section here where we're uh, into the barbarian kits at this point. Very interesting stuff. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot here. Uh, total, uh, let's go back uh, to the end. So, it, it's a total of um, 120, maybe 125 pages. So, a, a good length, a good length uh, booklet. So pretty good length booklet and everything. So, you know, quite a lot of information there. And like I said, I'm not doing a, a deep dive on this. This is just a preview. Um, certainly glad to have it as one of my collection. I have all, I believe it's all 11 of the, uh, the complete uh, class guides. So I will be continuing this uh, going through all 11 eventually. And then there'll be a corresponding um, uh, video short uh, connecting you back up to these long form videos as well uh, for those people that uh, will find uh, these full length videos through shorts first. You know, I, I like providing that uh, opportunity. It really does get uh, a lot more eyes on this long form content as well by linking it to a short, uh, you know, one minute video just talking about. Uh, the book as a product. So I hope you enjoyed this video. You all have a, a great rest of your day. As always, I look forward to seeing you at, on a gaming screen or at a convention sometime soon. And uh, also, as always, please remember to subscribe, like the video, comment, uh, ask me to focus on, on any particular areas that you wish for me to delve into. Uh, share this video out there and, um, you know, enjoy. Uh, it's Friday, so enjoy your upcoming weekend and you all have a good one. Take care.